Well, hello and welcome to the skating lesson today. I'm thrilled to welcome Olympic champion, three-time national champion, world champion, and five-time world professional champion, Dorothy Hamill. Welcome to the skating lesson. Hi there. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm well. It's really fun seeing you and talking yep. to you. Yeah. I'm so excited. And I was listening to stuff uh, to get ready for this. And I learned that you can't actually skate right now because of back surgery. So can you get, give us an update on how you're doing and, and what is your status? Yeah. Well, I'm still not skating. I have some, I have to order new skates, first of all. <clears throat> but um, I started having back problems um, right during the last tour I did with Stars on Ice. Okay. And then I did Dancing with the Stars. And whatever I was doing was making it worse. And I kept getting massages thinking, you know, oh, it's going to get better. <clears throat> and it got worse and worse. And it ended up being nerve damage or nerve, nerve problems. So I tried to avoid surgery. And it just got so painful that um, during COVID, I was lying on the floor, couldn't get out of bed, and um, which I guess couldn't leave the house anyway. So I watched all these videos of, of neurosurgeons doing back surgery because I'd had some cons consultations. Um, and so I finally was in such pain, I had to do something about it. So um, I had surgery and it ended up being not as complicated as all the other doctors had wanted to do and so um i'm better and i'm not really in any pain um but i'm very weak and just trying to get sort of active again <laughs> and now there's a skating rink close by so i can skate here um in the desert it just opened um but as i said i need some new skates so i'm sort of back to square one right now but still doing lots of physical therapy and off-ice training oh. has it made you miss it yeah, it, I do miss it. I just miss being out there in the, you know, nice, cool air. Um, I do miss that. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking back uh, about your career when you started. It seems like you really were in the right place at the right time for some good coaches from the very beginning. Uh, in your book, you wrote about working with Otto Gold. So how, you know, quickly did you have pretty talented instructors? Right away. I had no idea. It just mm -hmm. happened to be luck. Um, there wasn't a lot of, there weren't a lot of rinks close by, uh, you know, and skating wasn't that popular. So the coaches that were around where I lived, um, I just sort of happened upon them. Uh, Otto Gold was Canadian and his daughter was, I think she might've been Canadian champion. I'm not positive on that. Um, but then Barbara Taplin, that I took my group lessons. That's where I got started. She was a very well accomplished skater from Canada. So I had a lot of um, really by luck, I had lots of good teachers that were available and we didn't know how good they were, were at basics. So um, it was all luck. I actually started skating at a very small rink that I think you went to called Fritz Dietl. And a very small, yeah, like studio size Rockefeller Center. And you and Elaine Zayak were on the wall when I was growing because I had the Oh, you're one. kidding. Oh my yeah. God. Yeah. Yeah, Fritz Dietl, he was great. He was quite a character. For people who don't know, he skated on stilts. Yeah. He was gifted, I guess, I don't know what show, maybe he was holiday. He was Sonia Henney, I think. Oh. I didn't know him very well, but I knew his wife very well when I went back to start skating. I used to talk to her every day. Oh. That was really fun. That was a good place to um, do figures. <laughs> and Stuart Murray was there training too. So it was a weekend place that was open and mom and dad had to drive about an hour and a half to get there. So that was, um, <laughs> boy, times are different. How quickly did it take for your parents to key in that you were pretty talented at skating and that this was something to take seriously? I don't think they really keyed in. I think they knew that I loved it. Mm -hmm. And there were some parents that encouraged my mom to sign me up for a you know, local competition at Walman Rink in Central Park. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just, I think they knew I wasn't going to be a great student. I just, I don't know. I just, I was really shy and I love music and I was never going to be able to sing like, you know, Julie Andrews <laughs> or dance or act. So skating was my 
you know, sort of a combination of you know, enjoying the movement and the music. And I like to twirl around. <laughs> I was a twirly girl. So a lot of those small rinks were really good for me because I could just practice sw spinning. Now, Sandra Bezik told me that you were always the total talent, that you always just had a certain spark about you on the ice. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's very nice of her to say that. <laughs> when did um, you realize that you kind of had the bug or that this was something that you were really passionate about? Um, well, you know, I just, I think I had the bug from day one. I remember begging my mom for lessons skating on a pond because that's what we did and I wanted to learn how to skate backwards and she signed me up for group lessons <clears throat> and that was it every week I got my little gold star for being able to turn backwards and mohawk <laughs> return um, and then I got a scholarship for one free private lesson <laughs> and so I got my 20 minute private lesson and I was hooked I just that's all I wanted to do and you know, skating in those days in public sessions, you know, I spent, I don't know, it was like $2 and mom would drop me off and I skate all day on the weekends during the public sessions. So, you know, all, you could get, I don't know, two, four, six, eight, eight hours a day. I didn't stay that long, but um, all day long for like two and a half dollars. <laughs> so it was a babysitter, I think in some ways, uh, but it was just, I just feel so lucky that I was able to do that. How quickly did you wind up going to Lake Placid? That was my first, let's see, my first summer skating in Lake Placid, which was my camp, um, was, I think I was 10. Mm -hmm. So I started eight, at eight and a half. Uh, yeah, I was about 10, I think, when I went. So a couple of years. And how did you wind up teaming up with Gus Lucy? Oh, well, I was in Lake Placid. My first summer, I was taking... Um, lessons from Otto Gold and mostly figures because my figures really needed it. And I remember writing postcards to my mom. I want to take lessons from Mr. Lucy. I want to take lessons from Mr. Lucy. So uh, it was because I just watched him and his skaters and I was just in awe of the way he taught. And so the next year I was able to have some lessons with Mr. Lucy. And I just was one of those things, spending time in Lake Placid. And I would go there, we would go there on um, Christmas break from school and spring break. And so uh, I just just loved him. I, I had such respect for him as everyone did. I mean, he was really a force to be reckoned with. What would you think his key was as a teacher that made him so effective? Um, excuse me, I have terrible allergies here. <clears throat> I think, well, he, he wanted to be, he wanted you to be better every time. And I wanted to please him. And he was, you know, he would ask you to demonstrate something for other skaters. And when he asked you to do that, you knew that you had a little bit of a stamp of approval. Um, so I just, I just really wanted to do as well as I could for him. And he was just such a gentleman and he, uh, he, I don't know, he was just fascinating to me. Um, and of course he knew physics. So, you know, he knew how a spin worked and why it worked and why you, you know, do this position. And I see you've got a great teacher, by the way, for your scratch spin. Oh, thank you. <laughs> right. So. I just, um, he just made me want to do better, you know, jump higher, spin faster. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you've read Dick Button's book, but in it, he references your sit spin as being perfection for him. Which and book? His Which most book? recent book, he talks about your sit spin at least three or four times as being one of his <laughs> favorite things in skating. Was wow, that something that a particular attention was spent on or was that something that just developed because of Mr. Lucy or how did that come about? Yes, no, uh, Mr. Lucy, he was all about, you know, the position and the sit spin and having a straight back. And he would talk about, you know, keeping your, your you know, leg turned out at the knee and not your foot straight up in the air. And I think it was more of a, an aerodynamic kind of, so a backspin was always easier back sit spin was always easier because of the way that rotation, but, um, but no, he, he drilled a backspin into us. Oh yeah. Did he ever? 
Yeah, all spins. He was a master at teaching spins, I think. So how much time did you actually spend with him versus the Dunfields? Because it seems like back, everybody would do summer skating in Lake Placid. You were in New York. It seemed like a lot of split time. Yeah. Yes, it was. Well, I was in New York with the Dunfields all, all winter. Mm -hmm. Once I got to that point, I think I was 12 years old when I started taking from the Dunfields. <clears throat> and then I would spend the summers or breaks with Mr. Lucy. But then, I, I, then I'd go to um, Toronto and skate mm -hmm. at the Cricket Club with Sonia and Peter Dunfield. So there was a little bit of, you know, different training, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, places, mm -hmm. but it, it all seemed to work, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> it seems but like I, there were a lot of high level skaters around you. I know the, the Militanos were there, obviously Melissa did triples back early. Yeah. And... Oh yes, she was amazing. She is amazing, she was amazing. Yeah, triple toe loop this high. <laughs> she okay. was this high and she jumped that high. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant, very strong and beautiful skater. Um, but I was really lucky, even from a young kid just starting out, there were always um, really great skaters coming to the rinks that I skated, so I was able to watch them. And then as I got better, I was skating along next to them or in the session just below them um you know those days i was with vera wang she was skating competing um but i got to see in lake placid i got to see taller cranston and gordy mckellen and peggy fleming came in for an exhibition and janet lynn and some of the ice dancers and pair teams so i was so lucky to be able to watch those skaters you know every most of them every day I mean taller I would see every day mm -hmm. so and the Saturday club shows Pekovic and you know it was Saturday night they had a club show um, in Lake Placid every Saturday so watching them perform in spotlights and it was just really it was a great time yeah. you won the novice title in 69 you were second in junior in 1970 it felt like you were rising quickly. And then you got invited to Japan for a pre-Olympic competition as a senior. Yes. That Talk was. about that because it seemed like the USFS was trying to guide you where to go in terms of coaching at the time. I think so, but I don't really know. You know, just on my skater, I was going where people recommended to my mom, I go. And um, going to Japan with Julie Holmes um, was, uh, amazing. It was the greatest experience, especially for, you know, little kid who hadn't, not a little kid, but a teenager who hadn't really gone anywhere and hadn't traveled or, or competed internationally. And that was, so the pre-Olympics were a dry run for the Japanese to, mm -hmm. for the next year that the Olympics would be there in 72. And that's when I met Carlo Fassi. Mm -hmm. And um, he was, hilarious, he had a brilliant sense of humor, and U.S. figure skating wanted me to improve my figures, which desperately <laughs> needed to be improved, and so it was kind of determined there that I would skate and go and train with uh, Gus Lucy. I mean, not Gus Lucy, um, Carla. Carla. Yeah. <laughs> what was it? So what was bad about your figures at the time? You know, like what makes someone good or not good at figures? Because it's a foreign concept these days. It is, it is. And um, and it is, a, it's a very different skill, obviously. Um, my figures, I was just wobbling all over the place. And what Carlo discovered is that I had poor vision. So when I couldn't line up um, a, a circle one with the other, um, I couldn't see it. And um, we played a game one day when we were driving in the car, getting off an exit for Lake Placid. And he said, tell me when you can read that, that road sign. And I was like, mm. and it wasn't until I was right under it that, um, that I could read the sign. So he said, you know, you really need to get your eyes checked. And from that moment on, after I got my eyes checked, I was able to see clearly or clearer anyway. Um, so that was a big part of it. But I just got so nervous in competition. Um, I failed my first test once. <laughs> so I was embarrassed about that. Um, and, you know, that was the comment that all the judges, oh, darkest figures, she needs to improve her figures. So that's what I needed to do. 
I can't imagine competing figures. Like how, <laughs> what kind of minute detail are we talking about that makes one person better than another? You know, how- uh, the, the, um, the size of the circles mm -hmm. and the proportion of, let's say a loop, you know, supposed to be one third the size of the, the circle. Um, you know, making everything geometrically match, <laughs> um, having the centers line up of one another on, on a three lobe figure, um, tracings, of course, and then the turns, you know, clean turns, whether it's a, a three turn or a bracket or a rocker, you know, you're only supposed to have that much of the blade at the very tip top of the turn. That's when people would see the judges getting down and brushing off the snow and they were able to determine whether you were changing your edge at the proper time um, on the turn. So there was a lot there. Do you think they gave you that foundation for a long career? Because obviously you were able to skate for so many years and people today don't necessarily skate that long. Well, I think physically they can't because of all the abuse they do to their body I mean it's it's amazing what these youngsters these kids today um what they can do um so you know we didn't spend as much time also you know free skating a couple hours a day a few hours a day um but so the I'm not sure the figures uh helped prolong career but they certainly give you a great um basic you know, like like scales on a piano or bar work for a dancer. You know, it really trains your body to do basic things without having to, not that you don't have to think about them, but when it comes to choreography, okay, we do a you know, mohawk, you know, right forward inside, mohawk here. And so if you don't learn that uh, in a figure, it's, mm -hmm. You know, now that well, now they have moves in the field and everything, but it's just a different, it's a different translation. So, and I got to love figures, but it took a long time before I got to love them. You know, you have to achieve a certain amount of proficiency before they're fun, and that takes years. Is it fun to practice them that many hours every day, day in, day out? Um, it got to be. You mean figures? Yeah. Practice? Uh, yeah, it was it was a challenge, and so much of it, it it's hard to even explain. But so much of it, the the lighting made such a difference. So the rinks that had these beautiful windows, you'd have daylight coming in, and you could just see the the shine of the edges and the glide, and it was just very um, very zen to me. I just I loved it. You know, now everything's got all these walls, and you know they're not expensive buildings, most of them, with fluorescent lights, or, and it's just it's just not pleasant. But some of those rinks, like the Toronto Skating Club, um, well, a lot of them, the ones I grew up in, but uh, just made such a difference. It's like being in church. <laughs> One of these rinks had these beautiful stained glass windows, and these it used to be a dance, like a Spanish dance casino, I guess. Um, and the Spanish chandelier. So it was really, it was this sort of holy, holy moment to be able to skate in those places. It was really, I feel very lucky. So Carlo is obviously known for being a master of figures. So what did he teach you in terms of? <clears throat> he, um, gosh, well, he, he really taught me proper positions to be in to do the turns because you know I'd be like swinging a free leg out and it would make the circle go this way and then I do a turn and I bulge out on this side so you know he was really he taught proper positions mm -hmm. and um and then he just he just made it he just made it more interesting and you know he would say things like Stindian Stindian <laughs> Paul Wiley and I will say, you know, what did that mean? We didn't know what it meant with his accent, but we did it. You know, I think it just meant, you know, stay inside the line. I don't know what it meant, but he was very funny. And, um, and he just had these quirky sayings and with his Italian accent, we couldn't really tell what it was he was trying to say, but we did it. It was pretty funny. So, um, but he just 
he didn't make them seem so complicated. I think mm -hmm. that's, yeah. Because I knew I was with the master. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't ever question anything. He was obviously known for having so many top skaters. Who was mm -hmm. training at the time? You were, Julie Lynn Holmes was there and she yeah. was competing against Janet Lynn and Trixie Shuba. Who else was training with you? Um, well, Jan uh, well, Julie Lynn Holmes turned pro after the 72 Olympics. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and let's see, well, in Toronto, it was Trixie Shuba, Taller Cranston, Ronnie Shaver, Lynn Nightingale. Um, I think who else? John Curry. Um, I know I'm forgetting. Well, Sandra Bezik, Sandra and Val were, were pair skating then. Um, in Colorado, I think Scott Hamilton was there, but he was really young. <clears throat> so I didn't really see him there. I mean, I saw him, but I didn't really, um, you know, I didn't spend a lot of time on the ice with him. Because um, he was he was sort of the next two generations. If I think of every four years as a generation, yeah, he was two generations before or after me. Now in 72, you were very, very close to making it to the Olympics. Was that a huge goal for you to make it in 72? I mean, everything had been happening pretty quickly. Yeah. For you. Yes, I was really looking forward to hoping to go back to Japan and the fabulous Japanese people. Um, but I got, I had a flu shot. It was the first time I had a flu shot. Carla wanted me to get a flu shot because the flu was going around. And it, it, it was a live virus and I was so sick. I was in bed with a high fever for about two and a half, three weeks, three weeks maybe. And it was right before Christmas, around Christmas time. And I missed all of that um, training was it Christmas? Yeah, I missed all of that <clears throat> training. So I was only kind of back skating, uh, I don't know, two, two weeks, a week and a half, two weeks before nationals. So I was very weak. Um, you know, I'd lost 14 pounds, so, <laughs> which for me is a lot. <laughs> um, and so I was really weak and I just didn't, didn't skate that well. So I was disappointed as an alternate. Um, but then I got lucky, I got lucky, I don't know. <laughs> but Julie Lynn Holmes turned pro after that. So I was able to go to Calgary for the 72 World Championships instead of, I didn't get to go to the Olympics, but I uh, did get to go to Worlds. Did but you watch missed... the Olympics on TV? Yeah, sure did, mm -hmm. I sure did. Um, you know, and Janet, you know, Janet is just Janet. <laughs> um, it is Janet. Uh, so yeah, I watched. I think there, I think there was a tape delay, um, but I remember getting up early to you know hear the results. So yeah, they were beautiful. What was it like competing against Janet? Because your next season, seventy three, it was supposed to be Janet's coronation season. They created the short program for her. You actually beat her in the short program at nationals. I didn't realize that. I <clears> think <throat> you sent me something yesterday. I was like. I didn't think I did, but you know, just competing against or next to, I idolized her. I mean, I absolutely idolized her and I could never be her. And so, you know, it just, I didn't even realize it, but you know, I, I skated okay, I guess. I don't, I don't really remember that either, but um, yeah, it's just, it was a privilege just to be on the same ice with her really. Um, and after watching her for so many years, and I, there was a point when I was training with her, she came in to take lessons at the Sky Ring with Pierre Brunet. And so she lived in New York a little bit. So I got to see her and skate next to her there. And um, just, she's just glorious. Well, you were in the locker room in one of the articles that said in 73, when she was supposed to win the worlds and had just a really tough short program and it described it being like a wake in there that everyone was crying all the other competitors were crying because janet you know didn't uh, yeah but let's see what that was in lava yes yes i mean we all thought that you know it was her turn <clears throat> but um it wasn't to be and it was it was really sad because you know we were training 
beforehand in Barmish, I think it was. And, you know, we could see her, her, you know, practice and she, she clearly didn't enjoy, at least I, my impression was she didn't enjoy figures. I don't know. Maybe Carla would have <laughs> had the magic, whatever, standing, <laughs> whatever that means. I don't know, but um, she was just so beautiful and uh, we all wanted her to win. We always thought it was her turn, but Karen Magnuson wasn't bad either. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, next year, you actually became U.S. national champion for the first time. What was it like winning your first national title? <sighs> well, it was very exciting, but I didn't really, I don't think I skated that well. That's my, that's my recollection. And, I, and we had, must have had a short program then. I don't remember a short program at all. <laughs> you must have, yeah, because the year before it started. So, <laughs> so maybe I did the same one. I don't have any recollection. My thing is, I remember, I didn't think I skated that well, but I honestly don't remember. I remember what I wore. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, over the years, ABC Sports loved to show you at the World Championships in 74 when the Munich crowd was booing. Now, at the Olympics in 72, when Ogle Corbett was there, the crowd really jeered and booed for several minutes. So we never see that in the clip Ooh. that they show. But when she competed, they were jeering different scores and the crowd was quite um, wild. So you were in Munich at 74, about almost two years later. and. I guess they were booing for the marks of the skater before you? Yes, Bertie Chandro. She was a hometown, hometown girl, um, German. Uh, yeah, Munich, yeah. And the audience, she skated beautifully. She really did. Um, I didn't watch because I never watched anybody before me, but I, I, I knew she did. And so they, the audience wanted her to receive better marks. And they weren't happy with it so they booed and they booed and they booed and then I don't know that they realized that once the judges put their marks up they can't change them <laughs> you know you can't, well let me rethink that um and so I, I was you know to go on the to skate next and I got on the ice just to kind of get my legs loosened up a little bit and then the announcer announced my name and the booing got louder and louder and then he announced it again and the booing got louder and louder and so I thought they were booing me. And I just was, I don't know. I just thought it was about me. So I got off the ice and I was, you know, kind of crying to my father and Carlo and our team leaders. And um, then they said, okay, well, the referee has allowed you to go wait for a few minutes till the audience calms down behind. So I went, you know, to toad out to the ice so I wouldn't ruin my blades, picked up my guards. And then the audience started cheering so I thought, yeah, let me go. I'll go do it now. I want to get it over with. So I just stayed it out and stayed it. So, and but you had a fabulous great. performance. Did, ha, do you think that experience took the nerves away in a strange way because of the high and the low? And maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit. And you know, I think so, a lot of times I would get be really fearful, and sometimes I would get emotional and kind of cry a little bit. And I do think sometimes that gave me a little bit of a, you know, relieve some of the <clears throat> bottled up tension and nerves. Um, but I was never a good competitor. Never, ever, ever. When I would hear my, um, Michelle Kwan say she loved to compete, I thought it, I was going to my own execution every time I skated. <laughs> it was just, I was just not a competitor at all. So I got lucky. I don't know how... I'm sorry, I don't know how the skaters nowadays compete in all of those competitions. I just don't know how they do it. I, my nerves would, <laughs> I would never have been able to do that. So I admire them. Mm -hmm. So the next year you were second again at Worlds and you had won nationals again. At this time, what? how were you getting along with Carlo? Because in some of the articles, was he frustrated that you were not winning Worlds or kind of what was that dynamic like? I, I know he was very upset when I fell on my flying camel, uh, my flying sits in, in the short program at the Broadmoor, I think it was. Yeah, with the year Diane Delu won. Uh, he, was, he was really mad. Um, but, he, you know, he, 
he didn't say anything to me. He just sort of left the arena. And um, then I came back the next day and I skated okay. But flying Sispen often was um, often was something that I would fall on. I don't know why, but I did. And it's one of those things, you know, it's at the end of the program, the short program, and you think, oh, you know, it's almost over. And, and then falling, it's just, I guess I just lost concentration. Um, so, but Carlo, I mean, Carlo put up with a lot of crap for me. I mean, I was, I was, you know, I was a little brat, you know, <laughs> I wanted to skate well. And then when I didn't, I got upset or when I do a jump, you know, you have it, you land a jump over and over and over again. And then one day it just disappears and then it's gone the next day too. And then it's really frustrating. <laughs> and it's like, you have to, one has to learn that that's the beauty of, skating and so I would get upset and you know I didn't run through my programs as much as I should have and when I hear about the kids today you know training they do three or four run-throughs I couldn't do one run through half the time I was just exhausted always so um so I understand that Carla was really frustrated with me um and with, sorry mom my mom too she was a little bit of a a tough she was a tough one <laughs> so you say that your mom's a tough one but your dad was actually by the ice when you skated a couple of times so how did that happen because he would seem pretty involved in your career too if he's by the ice yeah <clears throat> yes uh, I think at one point Carla said to my mom and, and maybe it was even Peter Burroughs said don't <laughs> don't let Dorothy's mom near her because I could tell the minute my mom walked into a, a rink a practice rink just looking at her, what kind of mood she was in, <clears throat> which often wasn't a good mood. mood. Um, and so I think Carlo and people would say, you know, just keep Mrs. Hamill away from the competitions. She actually never went to my, uh, my Olympic. She never saw the, my Olympic performance. She was in the hotel. <clears throat> but my dad, uh, my dad was my rock. He was always very calm, at least on the outside. And because I didn't spend as much time with him, you know, he'd be working. And then on the weekends, he'd get the, he'd get the lucky job of having to drag me to practice rinks. Um, but we had the love of music and he often picked my music or would suggest things. And he was, um, he was a great, great dad. And I just loved him. And, you know, we'd sit together and he'd splice music together with, on his tape recorder. And so, and he knows music, he knew music. He was a musician. That's what he would love to have done as a job. Um, so that was really the special bond we had, extra special bond. And I, he was just, he wanted to make sure my skates were clean. And, you know, he'd wash my laces and iron them before competition. I mean, he really was that kind of a meticulous, fastidious, man and I love that so my mom was the opposite <laughs> <laughs> yeah well at the 76 nationals you've always said that it wasn't a good performance you think that Linda Fratiani skated really well Rewatching the video it doesn't look that bad so what was so bad about 76 nationals Ooh, oh nationals oh nationals I think I just wasn't in very good shape I just the, the dress I wore, I think it was for the short program. Um, I couldn't breathe. It was like, it was this sort of pink peachy thing and it was the fabric was, would, would sort of stick to my skin and I, I really couldn't breathe well. So I think I, and not being the best shape, I mean, I guess I was in okay shape, but um, not as good. So I think that might've been part of it. And, you know, and Linda, she's the up and coming girl with the triples. <laughs> and I was the sort of uh, the dying, dying champion, US champion, you know, it was clear that she was going to be the next, um, you know, the next, the next one. So I don't know, it just didn't feel good. Well, you talked about Carlo going off to Europeans with John Curry and being left alone, and that was a shock. What had there been a plan for what was supposed to happen after nationals? Was it ever discussed? 
No, it wasn't ever discussed at all. <clears throat> you know, and with my mom, you never know. <laughs> and, you know, I was, I mean, Carlo and I, we didn't fight or anything, but he would get frustrated with me because I'd start a program and I'd fall on the first jump and then he'd say, you know, start again, do it again. <laughs> and I just wasn't, I couldn't do it. I just, I don't know what it was. Um, so, of course, he wanted to go be with John for Europeans because I think he, <clears throat> he'd done that in past years. But my mom was kind of caught off guard. Um, and of course she made it seem like it was the end of the world. But in fairness, you know, she took me back East and I trained with Peter Burroughs. I'd always loved Peter. And, um, and it turned out to be a really great thing because um, I got to stay in my own bed for the first time in years <laughs> and drove so it was you know being home and I had a different venue you know change of scenery and um it was really um it was just good to have a change you know to be in a rink with other people not um you know not the people I was with all the time in Colorado because you know I think after a while you just need a little bit of change of scenery <laughs> and so it was a good thing and that's when um that is when there was a gas shortage. So only if you had an even number on your license plate, you could get um, gas on one day. And so, you know, with all the driving back and forth, it was, um, it was challenging, but it was fun. And Peter was great. And he really sort of tried to whip, whip me into shape. So it was, it was a good thing. One of the urban legends I've always heard involving cars is that one of your competitors coaches almost ran you down at a competition what well it was um it was a competitor it was in the olympic village and nobody's really allowed to have cars in the olympic village um because they were little in those days and yeah my competitor and her her coach was driving he had a car inside the village and they were she, my competitor was in the car next to him and they were coming straight towards us i was looking down on the ground but Carlos saw this car coming right to us and he pulled me away and the car went right off, right over where I'd been standing a minute or seconds before. So I don't know, you know, I don't know. That's. <laughs> and I did see them laugh, but you know, I don't know, maybe it was, maybe he would have slammed on the brakes or something, <laughs> I don't know, anyway. How did, you know, was the nope. rivalry that intense at the Olympics between you and the other skaters? Did it feel that intense? No, it didn't. It didn't at all. I mean, we all would tour together, summer, you know, summer skating exhibition tours. And it was, it was like a, I don't want to say a family, but we were all close and friendly. And I don't really know. I don't really understand that. So... But um, we all, you know, the East Germans and the West Germans and the British and Canadians, we all got along really well. Um, so Russians, they were great. Soviet Union it was then. So um, anyway, it was. Well, aside from that, how confident did you feel after training with Peter Burroughs? Did you feel more confident at the Olympics? I did. I did. Because um, we went to... Um, Garmish again to train before the Olympics because the women only had like an hour a day um, and an hour of figures, an hour of free skating. So we kind of needed to train a little more. So uh, we were there in, in, in Garmish for maybe a week and a half because the ladies were the last event of the, well, second to last event. Franz Plummer was the last event. But the ladies, so, you know, after John Curry won and all these, you know, champions, um, we were sort of waiting around <laughs> to do our thing. So it was, it was really nerve wracking. Um, so we were in Garmish a little bit, getting a couple more hours in a day. Um, so, but I did feel more confident for sure. Well, you describe competition as your execution. What yeah. is getting the Olympic long program like then in that moment? Did you enjoy it actually? Or is there uh, a moment when it changes for you? Uh, yeah, I didn't, I can't say I enjoyed it, <laughs> um, but it was, 
you know, it's sort of one of those things that you kind of, you dream about, you think about, and wouldn't it be great just to get to the Olympics? And then when you're there and it's like, oh, you know, I've competed against these women before and, you know, maybe I have a shot if I skate well. And so after figures being in second place was a great achievement for me. <laughs> um, and of course, Diane DeLue, you know, she had really beautiful figures. And then the short program, I skated well. And then the long program, I, I wasn't as happy with because I should have done a second double axel. And then the thing that is the glaring mistake was towards the very end of the program, I did a split jump and I stepped forward and I took a bobble. And that's the thing that, that's the thing I see all the time. It's like, oh my God, that was terrible. <laughs> Anyway. It's so minor, but I, I know that like for us, like your own mistakes always seem the worst, but yeah. 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 <laughs> but yeah, no, the second double axle, I was, I chickened out. I just thought, did I you, don't. Did you look like leave out the combination? You did a second double axle, right? Um, did I? I don't see. Yeah, I think you did. <laughs> yes, I left, right, 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 right. I left out the, the, the combination. I left out the toe loop. That's it. Yep. See, you know, the of Dorothy, you did the axle, you know, like, who cares? yeah, that was my nemesis. Axle, double axle was just, that's the one that killed me. I just, the falls I took on that, learning it and, you know, doing waxels, you know, hitting my head. And it was, it was, it was my favorite jump of all. Do you think you would have been better at it if you stayed with Mr. Lucy longer? Because Carla wasn't known for being a jump coach and it seems like you, right. you kind of bounce yeah. from people with different specialties. Yes, I, you know, probably. We probably would have been less terrified. I think. Yeah. yeah, I had a triple South Cal for about, I had a, a cheated triple South Cal for about a week. And then I finally got a clean one um, for, yeah, for a couple, well, no, maybe that was a, a week as well. And then um, Bob Paul came in to choreograph my sh short program, long program, can't remember, maybe long program. And so I didn't do it for a few days. I could never get it back, but I wouldn't have had it consistent enough to put it in my program. Mm -hmm. I have very weird sow cow anyway. <laughs> It's really weird. <laughs> well, you for someone that didn't like competing, you actually did go on to Worlds and win that. So mm -hmm. very impressive because today not a lot of Olympians would necessarily choose to do that. And then you became a national sensation, Miss Dorothy. And <laughs> ouch, ouch, ouch. <laughs> uh, talk through what was that? like to get that kind of attention obviously within skating people obviously would know you and talk about you and revere you but what was it like having that on the national stage for someone that's anxious to begin with yeah um it was it was exciting um staying to you know staying into to train for worlds was you know there, there was a whole battle between you know, the association and the coaches and the team leaders. And I always knew that in my heart, I would regret it if I didn't stay in to, to compete. And I know John Curry was on the fence about it and he was really cute. He said, are you gonna go? And I said, yeah, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna do it. And then he said, okay, I'm gonna go and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna train. So we, we stuck it out together and we were in Helsinki, Finland, which was kind of an interesting place to be, to be training for the world. And um, it was nice. It was, you know, it was a little calmer because you knew that that, that dream, you know, had, had come true. And so it was just one of those things that I really wanted to be able to be world champion. But there were agents and people trying to say, no, 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 Dorothy, she needs to come back home and, and you know, I wanted to get a job, I skipped <laughs> but um, so, but I felt I really needed to stick it out and do that. And then coming back home, it was crazy. It was crazy, at least for those days, right? <laughs> there was no social media, no, we didn't even have computers or 
I, we had videotape, I think. I think that was it. Anyway, um, it was over. Did you that low after the Olympics? Because obviously you had so much attention and getting ready for ice capades, mm -hmm. but people talk about a post-Olympic low. So what was that yeah. like? Imagine your emotions have to be everywhere at that point. They were everywhere. And I think luckily we were in Europe. So it wasn't when I went back home, came back home to the States, um, there was, you know, all of this, you know, all this stuff, you know, mail and fan mail and all wonderful things. But being in Europe after the Olympics and training kind of back in your own little world, your own little bubble, and you're all in it together training for worlds. I didn't have so much post Olympic um, lull, mm -hmm. but when I got back home, it was, it was very much a lull. <laughs> um, yeah, it was, it was a challenging time, actually. You know, you think you achieve this sort of lifelong goal at 19, <clears throat> and then it happens, and so what's next? You know, I wanted to tour and travel in an ice show. I always wanted to do that. <clears throat> but, um, but it was a huge transition. Uh, you know, not going into skate every day, you know, being wined and dined by all these agents and stars and managers and lawyers and accountants. And it was just, I made two and a half dollars babys babysitting. I don't know. That was my job before the Olympic. So it was, it was overwhelming. Your peer group had to have changed, right? Because you go from being around other skaters to now you're at a certain level of fame and notoriety. What is that like? Um, it was, as a really shy person, I, it was culture shock. You know, all of a sudden people would ask me questions <laughs> that I didn't have answers to. You know, if you want to know about spinning or jumping, I can tell you. But I, you know, people would want to know, you know, my stance on politics or, you know, whatever. I, said, I, don't, I don't, I didn't know what to say. You know, you live, you have to be in this sheltered little bubble um, in order to focus on what you're doing. So I, I, it's a wonder to me today that the skaters can focus on, on their skating when there's so much out there that, to read or to hear, or to, I don't know. I just, I was only reason I could do it is because I didn't have all that distraction. Well, when you opened in New York for Ice Capades, it was interesting, the next season, I found articles and you could look at the way the newspaper was running and your manager didn't have you talk to the press. He said he thought you were being overexposed and the, the press really hounded you for that. They said you were smoking and then Carlos sued you the same day. It was like a full page assault in the sports section. What? Yeah, it was, um, well, it was all, let's see. Um, my My manager didn't, you know, oh no, you can't be overexposed. He was managing um, John Denver and Karen and Richard Carpenter and Frank Sinatra and Elvis Presley and all these people. So people, they're used to being interviewed or no, they didn't have a lot of PR. So Jerry Weintraub, he was kind of of that same school. No, 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 you know, she needs to be, I don't know, protected, I don't know. Mysterious, um, yeah. Or... Part of that, and um, let's see what else. And so, yeah, I was smoking. Yeah, I was smoking. I was told that the girl said that's how you can control your weight, which is a horrible thing because that's what a lot of the girls did in the ice show. <clears throat> and let's see what was the oh, and Carlos suing. So mm, that was that was really hurtful. Um, but you know, I. I didn't know what was going on. And my dad had records of all these lessons he paid for and our understanding that there were a couple of very nice people that also paid for lessons for me. I don't know. Yeah. And, you know, I think it was, it was the timing was sort of perfect to do it, you know, opening night in, in, in Madison Square Garden. So yeah, it was a culmination of all this stuff. Did and the two was, of you ever reconcile, you know, in the later years or yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Yeah. And I, you know, I adored him and it, that's, I think the thing that kind of broke my heart because I didn't know all that stuff was going on. Um, so it was a huge sh shock to me, 
you know, I've been protected from all of that. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, yeah. And I can't imagine that a man would be in trouble for smoking or missing a press call in the same way. You know, I think it has something, you were a sweetheart of America, you know, and I think that that's a very female thing. Yeah. And you know how that whole sweetheart thing happened. So I won the Olympics on Friday the 13th, Friday, February 13th. And we had, um, you know, there were no internet. We made long distance phone calls. So it was reported in the newspapers on February 14th. And because I had this sort of rose colored dress on, that's how it got to be the sweetheart because it was Valentine's Day that it was reported. But I like the fact that it happened to be Friday the 13th. <laughs> so that's how that, that's, that's how that thing came about. <laughs> so I'm not a sweetheart. <laughs> it's synergy coming together. But uh, <laughs> I mean, on one hand, it sounds wonderful to be able to skate and do so many shows a week and make a living. It also has Ooh. to be exhausting. And doing the same show so many times, is it mind numbing? Is it just grueling? What is that experience like? Um, wow, um, it was work. And I think what made it work was that you're in a new city every week and you're doing 12 shows a week and you don't really have time to train. You know, and I, I needed to train. I'm one of those that I have to be overtrained in order to skate well. It's a, it's a mind head thing. And so I think that was the hardest part. But, you know, we had skaters that were, um, the, the cast were so darling. And, you know, I always call that my, my university because I never got to go to college. So I call it UIC, University of Ice Capades. <laughs> and it was, a, uh, it was a great learning experience and traveling and touring with these great young kids. They were kids. You know, they were sleeping four in a room and traveling on buses. And it was anything but glamorous. And I had it really well, because I had my own dressing room, <laughs> which they would come in. I would actually go into their dressing room because I wanted to talk to the skaters. Um, <laughs> but it was, they were really, uh, it was a great experience. And I felt kind of protected with them. You know, it was, it was our, our family. So, um, yeah, it was, it was doing the same show over and over again. It never got easy. And I think it's because of the lack of practice time. Yeah, I think. Well, you actually improved as a pro. If you watch your skating from year to year, you kept getting better. And I know that you credit a lot of that to working with John Curry. So what was that experience like? It was fabulous, fabulous. You know, every, training with John was, was one thing. But when he asked me to skate in his show, you know, cause I'd done the whole commercial thing and John was very much the purist and, you know, he always said he didn't want to be skating with clowns and all that. But I did, I skated with clowns and they were fun. <laughs> but uh, so when I got to skate with John, it was a whole eye-opening um, experience. Going to Vail is where he was rehearsing and, I got to skate class quite a few days in a row. And that's when I realized, oh my goodness, I know how to, you know, I knew how to do figures, but I didn't know how to skate this way. And so the attention to detail, you know, with the turnout of the foot and, you know, line, you know, proper lines and, you know, not scratching around, making a lot of noise when you're doing crossovers. Um, it was just nice to have the opportunity to just pay attention to the quality of skating. And so, you know, that was something, you know, I wasn't gonna learn any more axles or triples or anything. So it was really lovely to see someone that was gonna pay attention to the actual style. And, you know, he was an accomplished dancer, actor, he could sing a little bit even. Um, and from watching him train, you know, you just knew that he was, he was the real deal. So it was something to aspire to. Well, in the late 90s, I know that you felt like you had to go back to work at one point. One second. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Vacuum cleaner. No. Oh. <laughs> You're not going to vacuum right now. <laughs> anyway, 
right back again. But, um, I know that you said that in the late 90s, after everything happened with the ice capades, that you felt like you had to go back to work, but you really did some of your best actual skating around that time. And I know yeah. that you were working with Nathan and, and Tim, you know, how did it develop your skating? Well, the great news about Nathan and Tim, um, they trained, they skated with John Curry and the company too. So I knew them as, you know, friends. And I was looking for a new choreographer um, because I just, I needed to go back to work. And I somehow thought, oh, let me try Tim Murphy. And we'd known each other as kids, not well. And I thought, well, he'd be a great one. And so I, I think they invited me to skate in a next Ice Age performance. Um, and I skated a number that <clears throat> John Curry was still alive. Um, I skated a number that John choreographed, Pennies from Heaven, and then one that Nathan choreographed, an ensemble piece. And that's when I thought, oh my goodness, these guys are wonderful. And I started working with them. And then I got, I was able to hire Tim to choreograph a few pieces for me. And we just, we just clicked. And the great thing is, you know, we would do class together, just the two of us or the three of us. Um, and it was just something that was just terrific experience. And Tim and I, I, we hear music the same. I can't choreograph to it, but he can. And I think he understands my skating as well as any choreographer has. Mm -hmm. So, but they're, <laughs> I love them both dearly. And I love that they're, you know, still trying to, you know, keep the next Ice Age alive and well, and all these, you know, all of these skating companies that are like IDI. Uh, you yeah, know, I wanted to ask you about that. So you're involved on the board of Ice Dance International. And yeah. Why yeah. is that important to you? Because I think it's really important to um, continue and to have skating. Not everybody wants to be an Olympic champion. No, not everybody wants to or is able to put their body through what these, you know, contortionists can do today. And so, you know, I love IDI and the next Ice Age for the beauty and the purity of skating and ensemble skating. And the quality of the skating is what I really love to see. Um, and I don't know, maybe it's just because I'm an old timer, but I really love to see that, that purity and, you know, beautiful lines. I mean, you see a group of skaters all going in the same direction. You know, it's like a flock of birds. Um, and it's not easy to do that. Um, so uh, I just, I think it's important for people, you know, it's a, it's a, a mode of skating that not the people, in reality, people can skate that way, but the reality is the other, it's very few people can, can compete at that kind of level for Olympics and world. So it's nice to have another, um, another option for them. When you see skating today, do you think that anything is missing? Obviously, it's not as popular in the U.S. as it was. Do you think that quality is missing or the individuality or, you know, what's your take on it? <laughs> That's a loaded question. Um, and of course, whatever I say is, you know, people w won't agree with. But I, I find it hard to watch some of the skating with with, okay, for instance, let me say, I, try, I don't want to be negative, but when you see Jason Brown skate, you know, he does all these wonderful things and then he does this gorgeous Ina Bauer or s spiral or some gorgeous edge. And it's that aha, you know, it's that payoff. And there's just so much going on in the skating. It's required and you get more points for it that you don't ever really get that beautiful joy of watching, you know, what's one of the most beautiful things about skating is the pure movement and a skater just gliding, you know, all the way down the ice on, on one edge where you can, ah, you know, isn't that beautiful? So I miss that part of it. Um, so, but I understand, you know, all these spins and these positions that aren't always the most flattering, they have to do them. So I kind of miss, I miss the, the, some of the purity that is missing that they just don't have a chance to do because the judging scoring system doesn't reward it. 
Well, I think as we wrap up, you know, a lot of people would say that your skating had that kind of purity that they really enjoyed. But I was wondering for you, if you ever go back and have one performance that you'd want to see again or that really got you into skating, like, is there a couple that really wowed you or hooked you that you saw in person or on TV? Um, you mean skaters? There's yeah. Oh my gosh. Like if you got to see someone skate live, you know, who really would thrill you? Well, I mean, I love Yuka Sato. I mean, I just think she's, she's the Janet Lynn of the most recent. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean to take away anything from anyone else either. Um, but, oh gosh. I mean, I'd love to see Janet Lynn's Lyon, was it? Or her nationals in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where she had a pale blue dress and white sequin. I think I'd love to see that one again. Well, actually, no, I'd like to see John Curry. <laughs> Sorry. Any of his performances I'd like to see again. Did it you was... realize when you trained with him every day, did it feel that special or do you get immune to yeah. it? No, not at all. Because, you know, we all have such respect for, for John and his mastery of, you know, Choctaws in the other direction, which figure skaters don't do. You know, he could just do anything. His skates were like, you know, like a driving glove. They were so thin and he could do double axles and triple salcows and land perfectly on an edge. So he just, you know, his body was always in the right position. Anyway, he was, um, to watch him was just, <laughs> you know, jaw dropping, beautiful. Well, it thank you. It's a pleasure getting to know you and yeah. learn what you're doing. I love getting to talk to you and I hope I get to see you sometime in person, face yeah. to face. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I, got, I went to the IDI show in West Orange because JoJo <laughs> is there, but yeah, if you're ever up this way, for sure. Yeah. I hope so, yeah. And if you're ever out this way. Yes, where are you? Now, we're in Indian Wells right now and then I'm going to Colorado on Sunday. So we'll spend all summer there, so. Yeah, everything, we're packing up everything around here. So I apologize. For the chaos. <laughs> this was so much fun. Thank you so much for chatting with me. And this was such a pleasure. Keep yeah. up the, with the show oh. and do it yeah. again sometime. Absolutely. Okay. Bye now. Bye-bye.